It all started long ago. Names like Frizz Freeling, Tex Avery, Frank Tashlin, Chuck Jones, and Bob Clampett developed out characters that you came to know and love over the years. Tweety, Daffy, Porky, Bugs, and myself, Foulmouth, along with many others who became a part of our cartoon family and animation that still stands up today. We journey back to see the first characters we've loved for so long and the evolution of their tiny counterparts in... The original directors, Tex Avery, Bob Clampett, Frizz Freeling, Chuck Jones, uh, Bob McKimson, each one of those brought to the Looney Tunes something unique. You know, Chuck had the wit and sophistication, and Frizz had the music, and Bob Clampett had the insanity, um, and Tex had the gags. Um, each one brought something special to Mary Melody's Looney Tunes all in, in, in its whole. I think we tried to take a little bit from each of them when we went ahead with Tiny Tunes. I like to tell people I grew up in a cartoon. I, my dad was like a cartoon character. We had so much fun in our house with, uh, you know, between watching the cartoons and watching him create cartoons and characters. He constantly drew from his own life and put that into his art. You know, Dad started at Warner Brothers at a very young age. He was only 17, not formally trained, and completely impressionable, and had enough enthusiasm for 20 artists. Dad's first day at Warner Brothers, he animated on a, a Bosco cartoon. He was much more of the Disney influence. This is at the point where Mickey Mouse had become a star, and this was the Warner Brothers' reaction to Mickey Mouse. So he's a charming character, and you know he sings, and he's got his little girlfriend, but he doesn't have the edge to him that you'll find in the later Looney Tunes cartoons. When my dad was growing up, his mom had this framed picture on the piano of him, you know, laying on the little bearskin rug naked, and he was horrified. I mean, he grew up so embarrassed that she insisted on leaving this picture out. And so later, he had this idea to do this cartoon with two cats that were a spoof on Abbott and Costello that was called Babbitt and Cat Stello. And he was thinking of a foil for them. And he thought about doing a little bird, and he remembered this baby picture and wanted to bring the innocence and that kind of wide-eyed look from the photo into Tweety. So he, he turned something that had tortured him as a, as a young boy into the personality of Tweety. And I think, too, that was a little bit of his revenge in that Tweety's so sweet and innocent, but in the end, he gets those cats. <laughs> It was his dream come true to be working in an animation studio in this intensely creative environment. Probably the most exciting time for him was working for Tex Avery. Tex really encouraged him, let him bring out the craziness and all the enthusiasm that, that he could to the cartoons. And I think it really had a huge influence on him and I know Chuck Jones has given Tex Avery a lot of credit too. They were both young animators working for Tex and he just had an exuberance that really helped define putting the Looney and Looney Tunes. <laughs> The, the uh, directors, you know, Chuck Jones and Frizz and Bob Clampett. Even as a kid, I was aware when I watched these cartoons that although they were the same characters, 
they were different in each cartoon. They, some were alike and some were different, and I didn't know what that was as a kid. Now I know, of course, that these ones were Chuck Jones cartoons and these ones were Bob Clampett cartoons. You could see their own thumbprint. Another interesting character um, from those early days was from one of Dad's cartoons, The Dodo Bird, called Porky and Wacky Land, is probably my all-time favorite um, cartoon of my father's uh, because it really personifies his philosophy about animation. <laughs> It's a very surreal cartoon. He was very influenced by Salvador Dali and different artists of that time. It just is a groundbreaking cartoon. That cartoon still stands up today. Porky captures Dodo Bird. Extra, extra. Porky catches Dodo. What's that? What's that? Oh, where? Where? Minute, 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 now. Oh, boy, I got the last of the Dodos. Yes, I'm really the last of the My, when I was a kid, my, my favorite cartoons were, were Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies. When the, the Warner Brothers logo uh, came zooming up on the TV screen, I knew that like for the next seven minutes, I was going to be entertained. And then if Bugs Bunny's face you know, dissolved up, I knew, well, that's going to be even better. And perhaps even funnier than Bugs, at times the, the faces of Porky and Daffy would uh, fade up. And sometimes those cartoons would just be crazy. I mean... Uh, like a, a Bob Clampett cartoon with uh, Pork and Daffy. Like. When Dad was working for Tex Avery as an animator, there was a cartoon they were working on called Porky's Duck Hunt. Poor Porky, he's trying to hunt, and there's a million crazy ducks doing all these things to him. And as they start honing in and refining the cartoon, they realize, you know, it might be better, rather than doing that, to put all this personality into one duck. There's going to be one duck that just makes Porky crazy. Dad got to animate the very first scene where, where Porky meets him, and Daffy ends up bouncing all over the lake. Woo woo woo! <laughs> I love Daffy Duck. He's probably my favorite of the Looney Tune characters. Uh, he's got a wide range of uh, um, emotions. He's probably the most widely diverse personality of all the Looney Tune characters, and the the great directors used him to a wide advantage. Bob Clampett used to cast him mostly as a as a wacky screwball, whereas Chuck Jones would play him more as the arrogant ego. Jones used to say, Bugs is who we want to be, Daffy is who we are. There may be some truth to that because uh, you have to be awfully cool to be Bugs Bunny, whereas um, if you're trying to put your best foot forward and usually fall on your face, then you're kind of more like Daffy Duck. <laughs> Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny were my two favorites, and it was like Bugs Bunny was somebody sort of I aspired to be like, somebody who was cool in the room and always could top somebody, and the acting was so incredible in those cartoons, it just incredible. Come on, get it going! Now, you varmint, dive! Okay, uh, but you gotta close your eyes while I put on me bathing suit. Ooh, all right, but make it snappy. Ready! Splash! By God, the critter went and done it. When Tiny Toons was announced, everybody automatically felt it was going to be, well, it's, it's little Bugs, little Daffy, little Porky. And uh, that was never really the intention. The idea was to create new characters that might be junior versions of the characters, but, but different uh, personalities. These classes, ducks will find appealing, like, for instance, spotlight stealing. 
It's mine, it's mine! Woohoo! What luck! Yes, my hero, Daffy Duck! Even though you're kind of little, I'll teach you how to spray your spittle. Anyone got a chamois? Thank you, Bugs, from both our hearts. You'll be okay if you use your smarts. So now my song is almost true. Welcome tunes to Acme Lou. We obviously had some real cartoon aficionados amongst the crew, and they were the ones who wanted to go back and revisit some of the, uh, the old characters. We wanted to create something unique and whole unto itself. I mean, certainly the, the different personalities were inspired by the classic characters, the whole setting of Acme Looniversity and the fact that the Looney Tunes characters were the professors there. Um, that really sort of gave us the legitimacy for the rest of the series. Terry Semmel uh, and Steven Spielberg had gotten together and they wanted to uh, do something uh, in animation. They were working on some uh, feature ideas, but after a couple years of talking about it, they switched uh, courses and, and decided, well, let's make a TV series. When we first started this production process, I would say we were in major chaos. Um, I don't think we really knew what it was that we had in store for ourselves. Garbage. garbage! No one wants to see a show about some rich little rat named Marty! You'd better come up with a hit show by 9 a.m. tomorrow, kiddo, or it's the axe for us! Now, get to work! Yes, sir. <sighs> oh, that's hopeless. I didn't even know where to start. In the 90s, there wasn't a lot jumping off in terms of animation, but right around the same time, what was happening was Disney was doing Little Mermaid, which was the beginning of a whole new renaissance for them. Nickelodeon was just starting up, which was the beginning of a whole new renaissance there, and then we were doing Tiny Toons. So there was this feeling in the air to me that animation was gonna take off again, like it hadn't for many, many years. It had just sort of sat stagnant in Saturday morning, not really doing anything extraordinary, in my opinion. So there was this feeling on board for me, and I think for everybody else, that we were doing this thing and trying to make it extraordinary. One of the advantages we had at Warner Brothers was they really wanted to make uh, Tiny Toons in the style that the old cartoons were made, in that they had you know, units that had individual directors and story people and layout people in some cases. It's this great process of discovery. It's, it's starting. Space, the big parking garage. These are the voyages of the starship Acme. It's six-minute mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no duck has gone before. They're kind of, you know, similar to the, the classic characters, but, uh, but they have their own, you know, peculiarities. Like Elmira doesn't want to shoot rabbits like Elmer did. She wants to hug them and love them and squeeze them, and, and it, the end result is pretty much just the same. She's got all these, uh, you know, poor little bruised up pets sitting in cages at home. Dizzy Devil is not the Tasmanian Devil, and he's as vicious, but he's, uh, you know, a rowdy little monster like Taz. <laughs> Also, we can put them in more different situations, more contemporary situations than the uh, uh, Looney Tunes would find themselves in. Time to spill some of my clothes and be a rich guy. Don't believe it. I got lunch on Saturday. Pardon me. When we first started Tiny Tune Adventures, we had a meeting one day with Mr. Spielberg, and the issue of music came up. And we were talking about how important the Carl Stalling had been to the original Looney Tunes. <laughs> and Stephen said, well, of course, we're going to have a full orchestra for these cartoons. And I, having worked on the budget, went, Oh, no, <laughs> we won't do that. Um, we don't do that anymore. What we do, we'll build a library, and then we'll just cut in the pieces that we need to cut in for, for each scene. And he went, no, 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 no. We're going to have a full orchestra. We're tiny, we're tuny, we're all a little loony. It's tiny, tuny, and come and join the fun. And now the 
the music for our main title was written by uh, Bruce Broughton, our composer for the series, a uh, supervising composer, and he brought in all these other uh, great composers to do individual episodes. I mean, we had Stephen, who was uh, not only a creative mentor, but a, a guiding force. He supported the concept of uh, scoring every episode, which had a huge impact on the, the quality of it. I mean, it just sounds so good. <laughs> So let me get this straight. You want obedience, total loyalty, and I have to like you too? That's what I'm paying you for. Sounds fair to me. We started looking for composers who would have the Carl Stalling sensibility. And we were very fortunate to find Bruce Broughton, who came in and did um, the original work on the series, and Bruce not unlike the family tree that Ruger built, um, Bruce started bringing on composers underneath him to work on specific episodes. And we built this whole family of just amazing composers. We put together full orchestras. And I tell you what, it made a huge difference in those episodes. That music was wonderful. There's my pond. Steven Spielberg was very involved in Tiny Toons. Um, I know he was, he, before I came on, he was very involved in the development of the characters with Tom and, and some of the other people. But I, when I was on board, for instance, we would send him a script. We'd get it over to Amblin like around 5 o'clock, I think. And usually by 8 o'clock, he'd, he'd be calling with notes on it. And a lot of times I was working late, so I would pick up the phone and, and he would give me the notes. Now, I knew at the time that that was pretty amazing that somebody that busy would but I've learned since it's like ridiculous nobody does that I mean you have to wait like months sometimes for for notes on scripts you know oh uh, Mr. DeVille you forgot your credit card DeVille Mr. DeVille wait have I got a script for you the good ideas really came from everywhere uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we would, you know, the writers would just have an idea they carry in the back of their heads for months, and until they found a way to, to bring it out, and uh, and some of those were were our best stories. When you're working really close with a very creative team, it's hard to stop thinking about the characters on a daily basis. You, they're they're very much a living part of your imagination. You'll be in a funny little situation. Uh, here's a good idea for a story here. Story. Yes. I'd like to thank my brilliant director, Mr. Cooper DeVille. Now, nah, wait, I don't want to thank anybody. This moment is mine! There's a Byron Bassett cartoon where uh, the Bassett hound is rescuing these birds, these little birds that have fallen out of the nest from, uh, from furball. And that cartoon literally was inspired by my own Bassett hound at home, uh, a nest of birds uh, in our backyard. The, the birds had dropped out before they could fly, and there was uh, a cat at my house as well who was trying to chow down on these birds. I went to kindergarten. I remember um, my first report card. It said uh, that having Sherry in kindergarten is like having a cartoon character in class. We're going to work this year on curbing her wonderful enthusiasm. So I remember this because it, it angered my mother so much that she went in there and read this teacher the riot act about curbing my enthusiasm. But I would I thought of that when I was uh, writing for Babs Bunny. Because to me, she was somebody whose enthusiasm would not be curbed. And, you know, she just would not be stopped. No matter how many times you would tell her to pipe down or be quiet, she wouldn't do it. And I enjoyed that about her. Say, how about drawing me a best friend, a buddy, a compadre, someone I can talk to, rabbit to rabbit? A girl? Welcome to the 90s. Huh? So, how do I look? 
Well, you... And what about my voice? Well, it's, uh, uh... Is it a good voice or a bad voice? So Babs became, you know, almost w uh, overnight one of our real star characters in Tiny Toons. We wanted to create new cartoons that had that same sort of energy but with new characters and specifically made for a kid audience. As you know, Looney Tunes, Merry Melodies were for theatrical release and for, you know, an audience of five-year-olds to 95-year-olds. Oh, no. Tiny Toons specifically was made for that afternoon kid audience. The real old comedy! So, let's give them the magic chant! There once was a girl from Nantucket. Not that chant. Oh. Whose cartoon are we going to A lot of people I know talk about the early Looney Tunes cartoons and that there will never again be cartoons as great as that, that only the old stuff is is good. And I, I don't agree with that. The freedom that Dad and the directors had because it was the new frontier. It was, you know, the first time they recognized they could do anything in animation. And there was sort of an innocence in the world, yet sort of an edge from things that were going on. When I imagine what it must have been like for Steven Spielberg and the, the amazing team they put together for Tiny Tunes, what the challenge that they had to create a new property that was inspired by the Looney Tunes cartoons, but really needed to stand on its own and have its own spirit, that must have been incredibly intimidating, a really daunting task, yet they did it, and they did a beautiful job. You have to be able to go, you know what, we're going to do this, and we're going to carry the inspiration from the old work, but not stop and question everything we're doing and not constantly hold it up. They went into it and went for it. And I think that's what you have to do, and I think that's why those cartoons are terrific, and Tiny Toons still holds up today and will always hold Thanks, up. Thanks, guys. You saved my job. If there's ever anything I can do for you, I mean anything, just name it. Okay, can you get us a created by credit on the show? Yeah, in your dreams, pal. Why are you happy to just find out? You know, I think they're learning.